I want the man to give me the money. I want the man. And that's why we be having, you know, especially out here in the streets, you got a man for this, you got a man for that, you got a man for that, you got a man for that. Because in our work, in our mind, in our framework, that's how we get the world. Until one man can come give us all of that, um, until one man can take us on the trips, until one man can, you know, can can give us our weekly stipend or whatever it is, until one man can make us laugh until we cry, until one man can can work out with us, and you know, until one man can do all those different things, until one man can lay it down how we want it to be laid down, mm -hmm. uh huh, can do all of those things, then we won't settle. This one yeah. I'm excited about because it's been a long day, <laughs> but we'll talk about what? that later. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, but let me give a quick introduction to our guests because this is going to be a great episode. Uh, today's guest is a woman of faith. She's a mom of four. She's a writer, educator. She also has more than 100,000 uh, followers on Instagram, I want to talk about that as well because I'm not on that level yet. <laughs> she is a blogger. She is a poet. I check out her content on Instagram because I follow her as well. Brave Arts Community, let's show some love to Sabrina, a.k.a. She Unapologetic. How are you doing, Sabrina? Better now that I've made it here. <laughs> you know, it has been an incredibly long day and I've been looking forward to this moment all day you are my first podcast so i just feel so special this is a this is a special moment for me <laughs> um, so i'm really, really yes absolutely um i do i mean i talk for a living as a teacher um and i've done different projects and different things like that before but i have never like recorded podcast style conversation and so i'm really really excited for everything that we're going to talk about today because I heard you got some questions for me and I'm ready to answer them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because I watch your content and I watched one of your YouTube videos. We're going to jump into that. But I also mentioned in, uh, in the beginning about you being a blogger. So I read your blog on femininity. And this has really been a topic lately, especially for our community for sure what does femininity give us your definition of femininity and what do you think femininity is by today's standards um so uh like you already said i am a woman of faith uh more specifically i am a christian woman and what that means is i affirm the bible from cover to cover from cover to maps as completely true as it is written. Um, and with that being said, I do believe that in the beginning, God created them male and female. Now, when he first created Adam, I was just one person and he created us. The Bible said this is even before we get to Eve's exact creation. The, the scripture say that God created, um, you know, God created, uh, God created us in his image. Mm -hmm. um, and so. That means that everything that was in Adam already was from God and was enough to create us because we was created women, was created, we was created from Adam. And so that lets me know that uh, femininity is not this one thing, right? Because there are parts of it and, and there's an essence to it that, it, that we share, Right across, no matter you know how you identify your way or whatever your gender or whatever it is, there are parts of it that we share. But I do think that when it comes to my understanding of what femininity is, I really do think it is walking in the God given gifts that when He separated and made the two, because He took the rib and He made that one, He gave her some unique gifts, some unique talents. Um, a, a disposition and a role, which we, which is very evident from scripture um, and from the beginning, her, her ability to think for herself, um, to use wisdom, to, to practice influence, humility, um, all these beautiful things and maybe a couple 
perversions of beautiful things. I won't call them ugly things, but perversions of the beautiful things that uh, that we are gifted with as as unique individuals. Um, walking in that and in every iteration of it as God has given us uniquely as human being um, to the, to hit for his glory. So mm -hmm. to shorten it, being mm -hmm. exactly what God called female humans to be mm -hmm. in all its versions for his glory. I think that's what femininity is. I love that. And when we talk about the Bible, because we believers, right? You and I. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to those in the comments or those that's watching, I know if you have a different faith, that's cool. I respect that. But we're just talking about it from a Christian perspective. I tell men that God and Adam had a relationship first mm -hmm. before Eve came on the scene. Back. So I think it's very, and, and I want to talk to you about this later on in the show because I was watching some of your YouTube videos, and you know I'm not gonna jump ahead. I'm I'm going I'm gonna say that because <laughs> I want to talk to you about that. But I think it's important for a man and God to have his personal their personal relationship. Yeah. In a way when and I'm throwing out my air quotes for those who's who who is listening to the podcast to have this relationship, God, man, then Eve. So when you spending this time with God as a man, so it was one of those things where God and man have the relationship together and then Eve comes on the scene. So I think that's a very important piece for a lot of men to have that individual time with God before Eve, because I think sometimes, well, I think for most times men put women on such a pedestal that once they find out that she's human and she have frailties and and faults just like him then he sh he's like shocked he's broken to pieces yeah you know so i think that's important that we realize that we leave that we put god first our a thousand percent mm -hmm. and then the relationship that we have with our wife or our significant other so I, I really believe that there's a hierarchy when that comes to relationships. And I know I'm talking old school. <laughs> Sabrina, I'm 46, right? So I'm I'm, I'm kind of old school in my approach. But I do believe that there's a certain kind of hierarchy when it comes to God and man and then God and his relationship with the woman and all the other good stuff. So anyway, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Yeah. So, femininity. I want to talk to you about your blog. Okay. on femininity that mm -hmm. it was amazing so if you haven't watched it or i mean if you haven't listened uh listen to it <laughs> if you didn't read it yet i'm going to leave it in the comment section so people can actually read it because when i read Thank it on the way yes this was great so on the blog you says i am everything god says i am but a man doesn't get to experience that apart from doing what he is called to do as a man his failure to be who he is who he is called to be limit to to be limited how much of he can benefit from my womanhood mm -hmm. powerful can you break that down for me please um so first things first when i i'm i'm speaking specifically for me in that sentence okay, okay. i am everything that god says i am and i say that because Growing up in the church, we get the standardized version of womanhood. You're supposed to be the Proverbs 31 woman, and this is who you're supposed to be, and this is what you're supposed to do, and this is how you carry yourself, and this is what, this is what, so, and it, and it, and it almost feels like a factory pushing out, and, and then there's like this caveat a little bit in the Black church, because we're also like this powerful, you know, whatever, but at the same time, there's a certain amount of like, we have to be docile a little bit, a little bit less than other colors, but still, mm -hmm. right? And we have to, it's all these requirements, right? And I don't think any of those things in and of themselves are wrong. I do think that God gave me strengths. God gave me things to work on, but but he created me with personality. He created with me with purpose and everything that God says about me in his word. At both as a woman, as a human being, as his child, as a co-heir with Christ, 
right? As a mother, as a wife or a potential wife or whoever, all, all of those things about me are true. His promises to me are 100% true. He gave me the gift of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, I have a great faith uh, because of the Holy Spirit that is inside of me. As a woman, I am fragile. I am fragile. And uh, I was created as a, as a woman. We were created for men. The Bible says that. Um, and we were created specifically with men, male humans in mind. Um, I have a gift that is motherhood and nurturing. And the way that that shows up is very unique to me uh, as, a, as Sabrina, but it is also unique to us as women. Um, I, I believe everything God says about me. I believe that with my whole heart. And because I believe that, I know that I have the power to walk in that. And I do, no matter who's around, right? My kid, I'm going to be my kid's mama, even when they're not trying not to be my kids. <laughs> okay. Um, I am a daughter, even when my mama get on my nerves. I'm a sister, even when my brother, want, I want to choke him. Like, I am so many of these things in the way that I show up in the world. However, if I'm, if I'm as a teacher, because I am an educator, I teach middle school. Yes. I can be standing in front of my class giving the best lesson of my life. I planned it. I have incentives and I'm asking all the great questions and I have all this knowledge to give. But if me and my students aren't connecting, if they are not showing up in their role as the student, open and, and willing to receive what I have to give, well, then it doesn't matter. Because in the context of this relationship, my job in that moment might not be to teach them. It might be to connect with them emotionally so that whatever is blocking them from being able to receive from me, they'll be able to open up. And maybe they don't receive from me as a teacher that day, but they're able to receive the next teacher after them because I was able to connect with them in a certain way. So when I say um, that I am everything that God says that I am, but a man doesn't get to experience that apart from doing what he's called to do, baby, you got to show up in your manly self in order to experience the womanhood that I'm naturally displaying. And if you are not showing up in that manly self to experience the womanhood that I'm naturally displaying, then, then there is a part of my identity, a part of my humanity that may or may not show up to help redirect you, to help you better understand what may be blocking you from being able to understand experience my womanhood and you may not be able to experience my womanhood in the way that I offer it but maybe you'll be better off for the next person the next woman specifically to experience theirs but at the end of the day I don't I don't say that I don't believe that a man has to uh be a man in order for me to be feminine or in order for me to get in touch with my womanhood or my soft maybe I'm I show up this way I show up this way. <laughs> and if you can receive it, let it be, let it, let it be received. Let it and give me more of that manhood that I so desperately need in order to flower into the woman um, that 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 God is trying to create in me through you. Continue to create because he ain't done. And let us continue to build that thing together. But if you can't receive it, well, bless God for that too. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna I'm be me. I'm gonna be me regardless. <laughs> You're you you don't activate it and you don't shut it off. You just can't access it. Mm. See now, as I hear you speak, there's so many questions that I want to ask. Okay, so let me as she sips her tea. <laughs> let me ask you this: Did you see? And if you didn't see it, that's okay because I don't want to get off into it and I guess I'll say his name I guess did you see the clip from did you see the clip from Devon Franklin where he talks about Eve coming from Adam and she came as whole and Adam was broken did you see that video piece I didn't see that sound like some BS to me 
Okay. That yeah. don't sound biblical at all. <laughs> it, yeah, he. I don't want to turn this into a whole conversation. But anyway, no shade to him. But ain't no I, shade to him. God looked at his creation after Adam and Eve and said it was good. What what else is there to say? He didn't say it was broken. He didn't say anything needed to be fixed or upgraded. He looked at both that man and that woman and everything else that he created. He said, mm, very good. Right. And this was pre-fall, right? This was before the fall. Okay. You know, but I don't want to get too deep off into it, but it caused a lot of controversy and it, it the way he preached it made it seem like the woman was complete and Adam was broken. But anyway. I and was... that hurts me for me because okay. that's some of the same terrible theology that has bruised men, especially black men, and had them leaving the church in droves and have women in these pews screaming, worshiping these black male pastors and trying to fix then turn around and fix these quote unquote broken men. And it handicaps the, the men who buy into this into thinking that who they are, who God created them to be is anything less than perfect, anything less than worthy, anything less than amazing. Like, no, baby, you don't need me to fix you. All you need is Jesus, maybe a little bit of therapy, but really Jesus. So <laughs> like, <laughs> no, like you as a man are God's, a part of God's glorious creation from jump. You've been cold, my boy. You're amazing. And I and I, I wish that messages like that weren't uh weren't spread because it really does it don't it don't help us. It don't help nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Whenever you get a chance, check it out. Um, I'm definitely gonna <laughs> Yeah, because I heard I heard someone else speak about it and I was just like, oh okay, I wasn't the only person that you know kind of picked up on that. Uh so wow. So then when you when you talk about as a man getting to experience your full femininity, do you believe femininity can be turned off and on or is femininity you in general, regardless of the man? Femininity is me in general, regardless of the man. I don't think it can be turned necessarily turned off and on. Um, especially because I'm feminine when I come out the womb. Mm. I have four children. I have two boys. I have two girls. The way they showed up in babyhood. I don't care what anybody says. Maybe and maybe it could be my lens looking at them as boy and girls. I have boy girl twins. They share the womb. Um, and the way that they've showed up since they were babies has been different. And now that my children are young, you know, they're kids, they're you know, six, seven, and almost ten. Um, I'm really seeing that 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 striking difference, right? And it's not just about my boys wanting to play with trucks and and my girls playing with dolls. Let me say, my boys play with dolls too. They sisters dolls, okay? Like it's not it's not even about that for me. It is it is literally about who my children look up to. My daughters are looking to me and my mother and the other women in their lives, and they are literally emulating us. They are drawn to us. They see themselves in us and the way that they walk, the way that they dress, the things that they like, the things that, that, I mean, my, I remember my daughter was five and I did her hair one time. She was like, I look like a boy. I don't want to look like a boy. It was very clear in her mind what femininity on her is supposed to look like. And so before it has anything to do with the relationship, it has uh, with another person, femininity and masculinity, I believe, has everything to do with your relationship with God and your relationship with self, because that is who defines femininity and masculinity, which I do think is a little bit different than manhood and womanhood, because I have to grow into becoming a the woman that I'm supposed to be. Right. But I'm feminine the whole way through. I'm a girl the whole time. Right. And so the the woman that I show up as as 31, well, I'm not that's not the that's not necessarily the girl I was at 16 or at six. But the feminine parts of me have existed throughout. What has happened is I have learned amazing ways to use the those feminine traits in my life and to maneuver them. And I've also experienced uh, incredible amounts of trauma that have damaged uh, aspects of my femininity, my view of myself, my view of my body, my view of my sexuality, my view of my looks, 
um, my view of my understanding of, and how I think of the world, or how I practice emotional wellness and empathy. Tra uh, tragedy and trauma affects femininity and masculinity and then goes on to affect manhood and womanhood. And so I don't think it's something that can be turned on or off necessarily, but there are triggers that can help us, that can make us manage our, our femininity and masculinity differently depending on whatever situation that we're in. I saw a reel not too long ago um, and I keep seeing it over and over again. It keeps showing up on my timeline where a woman is like, you know, there's one man who will tell you that I am, you know, the queen of his life and I made his life so much easier and better. And there's another man who will paint me as a villain. Believe both of them. And I think that that's so real because I am the villain in probably a couple people's story, man and female. Um, and I am also the best thing that happened to somebody or to a couple people out there in the world. Believe both of them. Mm. Because the same femininity that somehow convinced Adam to bite into that fruit <laughs> is the same femininity that honored God and God said was very good just a chapter before. Mm -hmm. It's just how you using it. How are you using it? I agree because we have all played the villain in someone else's story. And I'm glad that you said that because I was married for 15 years before I went through a divorce. So I'm sure... I've been the villain in my ex-wife life, right? <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I know, right? And, and I ain't make it to 15, but... <laughs> oh. I know, right? And I've accepted that. But what I realized, too, is when we own up to our issues and how we can grow as a person from those issues, it helps us to heal faster. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. You know, so I realized why I went wrong in my marriage and the Brave Arts community, they know my story. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I'm glad you brought that up because so many people, especially when dating, the worst thing you can do is just constantly blame your ex. You know, she did this. He did like. So when are you going to take accountability for your actions? You know, because a lot of times accountability by today's standards, accountability is almost like a curse word, right? It, and it sometimes it feels like that, but I also think that even amongst those who practice accountability, there can be there's a range, right? Because there's sometimes this self-deprecating accountability that mm -hmm. I'm trying to convince a lot of uh of my of my associates out of where it's like just because you know what you did doesn't mean that you aren't who you are, right? Don't let that, don't let that shape your entire identity. Yes. yes, you cheated. And you might have even done it repeatedly. You have the power to not, <laughs> to not do it anymore. You have the power to, you have the power. Yes, you lied. Yes, you were deceitful. You can practice rad radical honesty. That was an action. Let's get to the deeper parts of why you chose those those things, because that to me, that's where the real sin is. What are you believing about yourself? What are you believing about God and, and, and everything that he has for you that you chose to deceive people you love? Right. That's that's painful and that's wrong. And you can stop. You can stop doing that and move to a completely different sin that feels more harmless because you haven't fixed what's on what's on the inside. Um. And so I think accountability, even I was on a friend, I was on the phone with my friend earlier and she got in my behind. She had to hold me accountable because she, because I was holding myself accountable. She was holding me accountable because I was holding myself accountable. And she was like, Sabrina, you think just because you do X, Y, and Z, you deserve pain. You deserve suffering. You don't deserve support and help. Stop that. She got on me about that. And so it was, so it, it, it comes to a point where, um, we definitely have to learn better how to take accountability. But it's for me, uh, it's more about a grace perspective. If I constantly tell myself that I need the same grace that I, re I need to give the same grace that I require, that's the accountability, right? Because it, it can't just be you, you, you. He did this, he did that. My ex-husband did this. And my ex it can't just be that. But it also can't be 
well, I just, I did this in my marriage and I did this wrong in my marriage and I did that wrong in my marriage and I deserve to be alone for the rest of my life and I deserve to, well, it can't be that either. That's not what, that's not God's design. I don't think God designed that for us. It has to be, he made these choices and that's how that affected me. I understand that I made these choices and that's how it affected him. And this is also how my terrible choices affected me, right? Because our, our sins don't just hurt other people. It hurt, our, it hurt us too. It blocks us from the goodness of God. That momentary, whatever felt good, or even if it didn't feel good, maybe it was self-protection, which is why you lied, right? So it don't necessarily feel good to lie, but to tell the truth would have been, would have felt too vulnerable. It would have felt too risky. And, and so you chose the lie instead. You blocked yourself from being fully loved in mm -hmm. that moment, from being fully seen because you wanted to lie and be deceitful instead and hide can't be fully loved in the, in, the, in the dark. So um, it has to be the grace. I need to give you the same grace that I need, that I know I need. That is the accountability is an acknowledging that I need grace because I know I'm an F up. I know I'm going to say something out of line. I know I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm going to be so real about that that when I look at you, I see myself and I shut up. And I let you talk and I let you feel. And when you go crazy and you stress and you lash out, I create peace because I know that's what I would need in your situation. So, yeah, it's, account it's, it's, it's more than her personal accountability. It's communal accountability. Yes, this is good. I want to talk to you about because you talk about grace and rarely do we discuss these things in relationships because I do believe two things you do need for a healthy relationship or marriage is grace and space, right? And mm -hmm. we talked about, of, 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 talk about vulnerability like when I'm struggling with something or when I feel like I have to be vulnerable with my wife, I will ask her or will say, are you available? Or, you know, can we talk for a second? So that way she has a different set of ears. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm learning to say things deeper than just I'm mad or I'm pissed off. Like <laughs> I'm vulnerable or very uh, good. Very yeah, good. I feel alone. Like going deeper opposed to I'm just mad. Because I think a lot of times with men, we only have you on that phone all the time. Or I want your attention, babe. I feel I, I feel alone mm -hmm. and I need you. I like you. I want to spend time with you. I want to see your face. That sounds much better to me as a woman that you that you want me. Not you want to control how I spend my time. Yes. And, you know, it's funny you say that because I, I'm, I'm thinking the other day because I think pride destroys a lot of relationships too. destroy mine. <laughs> <laughs> say that. OK, well. You want to talk about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> let, let me let me let her, let me let the groundwork real quick then, since we're here, because I don't think we talk about this enough. And I never talked about my relationship to like on the interwebs for real. It be uh -huh. it be out there in little patches, but I don't talk about it on the internet. Okay, well, beep, 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 but I can. Beep. I don't have no problem. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. So here's the thing. When I was talking to my wife the other day, you know, it was like texting because I'm at work and I told her because I used to, I, sometimes I still struggle with pride, right? Like I still struggle with it sometimes, but I text her the other day and I said, I miss when we get to spend a long time together and we just kind of like kicking it or we just listening to some hip hop, whatever, like just that individual time where we're not discussing bills, kids, responsibilities. And it yeah. took me to be vulnerable to say that to her, like, I miss spending that time with you because we're so busy. But I struggled with it because I was like, oh, this is going to make me vulnerable. This is going to make me feel like I need her kind of thing. So I struggled with that, but I did it. Okay, well, let's talk about it then. <laughs> you want to you 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 want to get you want to give us just a little um sneak peek, just a little bit behind the curtain. Just give us a little bit. You ain't you don't have to spill all the tea, but if you this is an exclusive, right? So 
You got to give us for a sure. Look. For okay. sure. Okay. Um. So I got married straight out of college. Uh, I got married at 22. It's November 22nd, 2014. Uh, so hey. I was fresh out of college. Um, I graduated in May. We had a baby already. Um, and I definitely liked that boy a whole lot. I ain't gonna hold you. I liked him a lot. I did. Um, it was crazy because I didn't like nobody before him for real. Like I liked it. I liked boys and I went out on dates, but I had not really had a boyfriend for real before him or anything like that. Definitely wasn't having sex or anything like that. And then he just came out of nowhere and I don't know what list got read from one of my old journals, but he just seemed like everything that I wanted. <laughs> like he was just, it, the, the list was listed. Okay. He was in mm-hmm. law school. He was black, specifically dark skin. You know, it's, I'm not colorist. I'm not racist. I, I just like what I like. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, you know, was a church goer and not just a church goer, but um, there are theological convictions that, especially back then, I held on to very, very, very strongly. And even though he was new to a lot of those things, he didn't become a believer until his adult uh, years or until like, you know, right around college or whatever. He was uh, growing in that tradition and growing in that understanding and really outpaced me in the in the ter- in the length of our friendship and relationship. And while our relationship was full of tumult from the beginning, it was messy and it was everything I would have would have never wanted for a relationship or for a boyfriend or girlfriend situation. Um, he, I was in love with him as a as as a man, and that's important because I'm gonna come back around to that point. <laughs> okay. Everything about him, I loved his origin story. I loved I loved how I loved I loved his I, I loved his dreams and his goals. I love dreams and goals that he didn't have for himself yet that I saw in him. I, I that he now still kind of has a little bit, but whatever. Like I, I, I love that man. Sideburns. I loved his left dimple. I loved it all. Loved that man to from the day I decided I loved him. And um, when we got married, again, like I said, the whole thing before that was messy and and terrible and. It just wasn't an ideal situation. Um, it's not something that I would recommend. If I could go back and say, I would have told me to wait or not get married. Even though I loved him, I would have said, this is not how you do it. Mm. Um, and so we were married. It continued to be messy. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of bickering, a lot of confusion. Um, it was just really, it was really, really painful. It was really painful for the both of us. Um and we fought over the things that a lot of couples fight over, mainly money, mm-hmm. mainly on my part. My, my, mainly my choices were money. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can I can very much attest to that that was uh, a huge uh, issue that I brought into the relationship because that's who I was like before I was I wasn't great with money before, like the actual practical usage of it. I had a lot of knowledge up here about what was best and that showed up in different points in our marriage. But my actual practices in certain areas were very damaging to me and very and obviously in a marriage, this one. So it was, you know, very damaging to us. And I know that there there, there are probably countless opportunities and situations that we missed out on uh, because of my choices. And I still carry a a lot of shame around that um, even. But the fact of the matter is that was some of the issue that I brought. But I also know the personal inner issue that I brought that he might have felt but was never able to actually verbalize in a way that I could understand was how cold I felt or was um, toward him. I guess that he expected me to act like girls from his past because he did have relationships before me. Um, I wasn't the typical girly girl texting you all day, calling you 10 times a day. And, oh, babe, I just want to be up under you all the time. And when you come home from work, I want to tell you all the gossip at work. No, <laughs> when I'm at work, I'm at work. I'm trying to be great when you, and I want you to be great at work. So let's leave each other alone. And then when we come together, in my head, at least this has supposed to go, my man supposed to come home. We supposed to kiss. We already had a kid coming into the to the to the to the wedding to the into the marriage. Right. So it's not like we had that period of time where it's just 
the honeymoon season and everything is good and we just get to curl up on the couch and ne watch Netflix and no, baby, somebody cooking dinner, it's, it's laundry getting done. There's life being lived here already, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the inner issues, this is what I truly believe. The inner issues, going back to what I was originally saying, the inner issues that I brought with me, that fear of rejection, that's the hugest one, his fear of abandonment and rejection. Those are the things that even when you cooking dinner, washing the dishes, that's the thing that stops you from touching the man or the woman you love and just lightly caressing their face because you're scared they're going to jump back or act weird or act like they don't like you or act like, what are you doing? It's weird stuff in your brain. It's like, he married me. Why would he not want my affection? Mm -hmm. And there were times where I showed affection in a way that I knew how that I didn't feel like was well received. So when that happened, and, I'm, and, and I know for a fact that the same thing happened to him where he was trying to show me affection in, in a way that he knew how, and I did not give him the reaction he was looking for. And his man was like, well, won't be doing that again. <laughs> won't be putting myself out there like that again mm -hmm. and so we're constantly playing this game within ourselves of let me tiptoe out there and try to love this person a little bit oh they didn't respond how I want them to respond I'm going to go back to my corner and it and it was um, it, between the between the arguments because the arguments were frequent yeah. constant <laughs> yeah. the, in the tension in between mm -hmm. there wasn't much loving happening I know, I know on my part, mm -hmm. the, the woman I've allowed myself to be in my friendships, uh, the small amount of, I guess, dating-ish or whatever you want to call it, I've done in, since the, in the ending of my marriage. Um, and who I am to myself. I know that I am capable of so much more affection in love and openness and tenderness. And I had to make a choice within myself that I was gonna do that recklessly because I deserve to walk in that part of my femininity. Mm -hmm. I deserve to be soft to people that I love. I deserve to cook for them and kiss all over. I don't, I don't really wanna get married for real so that, you know. Let's throw that out there. It's all good, I, you know. But if I did, marry folks, though, <laughs> yeah, right. Now, I if you. that was the goal, speaking of scary to remarry, baby, I'm very scared. <laughs> <laughs> but if that was the goal, I, I, you know, I just, I deserve to plan elaborate trips for him to buy. I used to buy my. That was my love language. I used to buy my ex husband a lot of gifts. I used to. I remember this one birthday. I did a senses uh birthday gift. I gave him like a bag with sight and sound and taste. He had like these new colognes, and I got him this watch that he freaking fell in love with and lost in an airport in Atlanta. He was very sad about it because that was my his favorite gift for me. Like. That was my one thing I did get right, but I still got that wrong because I was spending money we didn't have and he didn't like that very much, which made me feel rejected because it's like, dang, I worked so hard for this. Why are you tripping about the money? We gonna make the money. Just enjoy the moment. Mm -hmm. Money stories, life's purpose, so many different things that we really could have just had a conversation about instead of it, things getting really bad and us arguing and everything blowing up and us antagonizing each other's mindsets and experiences, it really could have just been a, let's have a conversation, come to some real agreements and compromises, make some real decisions. I, Sabrina, needed to practice radical honesty, radical vulner vulnerability, and um, radical self-discipline, um, because it wasn't, it should, it, even though submission is, was, and is important to me, it couldn't, it could have never just been about submission to him. It all I had to convince myself that what he is saying and the vision he has for our family is right. And in order to accomplish that visit, vision, we have to do it in a way that recognizes that his systems work too. And that's where I wish we could have come to uh, 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 understanding that 
both of our unique experiences and how they shape our minds, our personalities, our desires, our systems are equally value, valuable in this marriage and in this family. And our, our family, our legacy, our mission is worth staying up all night for, talking, figuring it out. I wish we could have come to that point, mm. but that would have required a vulnerability on my part and maybe on his part too, but we're not focusing on me, I'm focusing on me. It would have required a vulnerability on my part and a sitting down of my pride to say, you could say everything right and you could do everything right and he could still not like it. But guess what? God is still in control. God is still good. You are in no danger. You are still safe. Mm. Safety is no, no, my, it's the number one thing for me. If I don't feel emotionally safe in a situation, I don't care if it's my parents with my mom or my friends. They, they, they wouldn't be my friend if, they, if I don't feel emotionally safe with them. <laughs> um, but, you know, if I don't feel emotionally safe, then it makes it a lot harder for me to do that which is why I come back to the point about me being in love with him because I really did love him, but I didn't always like the way he made me feel. Most of the time, I did not like the way he made me feel, especially about my own self. And um, those two things I think are important. I can love you and I don't like the way you make me feel. And there have been dudes who have made me feel like I am the world. But when I look at them, I don't feel any admiration I don't feel, I feel a general respect for them as a man, but I don't look up to them. Like, I want to kind of look up to my partner. I want to feel like, damn, like, mm, you got something going on over there and I want to be a part of that. This is also, I don't be feeling like that about these dudes. I don't. I, don't, I only ever felt like that about my ex-husband. I'm not going to lie to you. So let me ask you this, because there is so much to unpack. I I'm, I guess I'm going to have to bring you on the show so I'll do it like a part two, <laughs> because there's so much stuff I want to ask. Yeah. Um, because I'm always asking questions. When we talk about admiration, what are the traits of a man that you would admire? Mm-hmm. Me personally. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, your personal Me? opinion. Yeah. Because this is a bit, this is a, this is an interesting question. It's a question I get asked a lot, and I try to skirt around it because men usually ask me this because they try to come off as that, and I'm like, no, baby, just be yourself because I'm not gonna like you anyway. Yeah. Um, um, me personally, number one, I admire a man who uh, knows God cognitively as well as emotionally. Um, that's number that's number one for me. Growing up in the church and the the men who were in the church, I saw so many different types of men who were in the church and how they showed up. And because I went to a mega church that had its own youth ministry. And so and we were it was literally completely teenage ran. So we was just in there 16, 17, 18, running around, being grown, doing our thing, being out there talking about God. Like we was really in the, in the early 2000s, we was hitting them streets. We was outside. We was repping for Jesus and having a good old time. And, and so when that's your upbringing and you see boys who could easily be mistaken for trap boys, but they passing out tracks and feeding the homeless and they still, they still got them. They still, you walking down the street with some little boy from school and they, and they, they this is real life. They see me walking down the street with some little boy from school. They picked me up, threw me in the car and walked off with old boy and old boy never talked to me again. Right. So <laughs> yeah. there's this like protection aspect and all this other stuff. And all of it was fueled by the church and Jesus and stuff. So that, so that watching them worship on Sundays and cry out to God, that was so beautiful for me. But when I got older, because I've always been very intellectual uh, when I was, you know, in my teen, late, late teen years, and I started reading more theology and listening to more, just like it, it just going really, really deep into it. I mean, trying to learn Hebrew and Greek. That's how bad I, I want. I wanted to read the original text. Okay. I wanted to read what Jesus, what Jesus originally said in the, in the Cohen Greek or what they wrote. I want to see, I want to read it how they wrote it. I don't want to read King James version. I want to go before that. Like that's where my brain was. And I was reading everything from, you know, I was just really going deep into, into my theological convictions. And a lot of the guys that I was around were very much still in that very emotional, like, I memorize a couple Bible verses and I love, you know, going to church and serving on Sunday, but I'm not really interested in theology or studying. When I met a dude who was, 
which was my ex-husband, I said, oh, so you like books about Jesus and theology and, and, and doxology and how all that affects how we live? Oh, you like that? Okay, that's I like that. I like that you like that. And you like it on your own. I came to your room and it was a stack of books already there. Like I seen it. So it is it is not to impress me. This is who you are, right? Even when I'm not around, this is what you like. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, that intellectual and emotional. Um, he had the intellectual more than the emotional at that point, which was perfectly fine by me because I was so used to the emotional. I didn't really care that much. But now at this point in my in my life, I very much need both, which also comes with a commitment to church and church activity and church life. Like even if we ain't going to church every single Sunday, 52 weeks a year, that needs to be a part of your life. It needs to, you can't view it as an option. Like it has to be like, something really important sickness or you know that's pulled you from church or whatever it can't just be like uh you know yeah yeah the, um, i go to I, I hang with my friends and we all christians so i'm in church what <clears throat> now and i got close friends who operate in that vein that's cool for you but as for me in my house we go to church on sunday <laughs> like mm. and we tithe and we are a part of ministry and uh we really walk this thing on out, right? So, so that's number one. Um, number two, I really, really admire work ethic. There is nothing sexier to me than a man with ambition. Mm -hmm. Like, so a little bit about my ex, not to make it about him specifically. Yeah. He thought he was going to be a ball player like most little black boys do. And he worked really, really hard at it because he wasn't very tall. And he don't necessarily have a, a naturally athletic build. He was, I ain't know him back then, but I believe what they tell me. And they tell me he was good on the court. Yeah. So once he realized, but he was, he wasn't, he wasn't all the way there. He had some behavioral issues. <laughs> and so once he realized he wasn't going to the NBA, but it was already, you know, the end of high school, he decided he wanted to be an attorney, but you know, he effed over high school academically. So he didn't have the grades and the test scores to do what he wanted to do. But he had a plan. He had a plan. Mm -hmm. He followed through on that plan, showed up, went to the, one of the top 10 law schools, which is how we met mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. And he's now a, 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 a very hardworking uh, attorney with a lot of connections, making a lot of moves. He's doing his thing over there. A, and I, I admire that about him. He had a plan. He followed through on the plan. It wasn't a get rich quick scheme. It was. This was, he knew, he knew the firm he wanted to be at. And no matter how many twists and turns came about, which included meeting me and having a baby while he was in law school, he never let up. And by God's grace, because I recognize it was totally God's grace, right? Because like I said, it's not like he had this, it's not like he was, he had an apprenticeship when he was grow, growing up with lawyers and he had that around him. Like, no, but I'm not going to rob that man of his work ethic. Mm -hmm. He, he, he go to work. He put in work. He networks. He's a, like he do what he have to do to get where he want to go, right? And I, there are other men in my life that are very much like that, who have these visions and these plans, both in ministry and in mark in the marketplace. And when I look at that, I think it's even working with their hands, right? I got brothers who, you know, they they might do one thing for a living, but they have you know rental properties with their wives, and they like we gonna continue building this, and I'm a, I'm gonna do everything myself. I don't know. It's just that hard work, that going after it. Mm -hmm. I just love seeing that, especially as it's coming to fruition because of the work that they put in. I'm like, that's so freaking dope. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, and then the the final part of, you know, outside of Jesus and in and, and hard work slash ambition, um, is uh, and this is never mind. The one thing that would make me um admire a man uh, a lot is how how generous he is, how he cares for the people around him. Mm -hmm. And I believe that generosity is first a heart thing, right? Because I know men with money mm -hmm. who are not afraid to give it out or like loan it out, mm -hmm. but they'll lord it over you mm -hmm. and make you feel uncomfortable about borrowing money from them or getting money from them. Mm -hmm. That's not generous to me. Yeah. Um, and then there are men who don't have no money. They have their bodies and they have their time. They have their time. Mm -hmm. And when you call them, they come. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like my little brother is one of those guys. He is very, very generous with it, with his time and with his talents. Uh, and I, and I really, really love that about my little brother. And I look up to him in, in, in a lot of ways because of that. So, uh, how, how you show up for people in need, uh, I really, really, that just makes me, mm, it do something for me. I'm not going to hold you. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's, no, that's what's up. No, I, and I, I totally agree with you because I tell people this, even when it comes to coaching, even if I'm saying stuff on social media, I always tell people, marry somebody who loves God more than they love you. Mm-hmm. Because through the relationship with God, you can realize how important how his love is for you as an individual, you can start to share that love to others, right? Mm-hmm. So that that was a trait that I loved about my wife. Like she like she has a heart for God. And I'm like, okay, that's what's up. A lot of times people can't really fathom that. They can't fathom like you're gonna put God over me. Like people want to be God in your life, you know. And I'm like, nah, that's not cool. You know, I want to be everything. You can't be my everything. Everything. Yeah, right. You broken just like me, right? So, <laughs> so ain't nobody be everything to me, and I can't be everything to nobody. Exactly right, and that's that's a cross no person can can carry, right? You know, no no human can carry because I'm just like no. But uh, so I agree with you about a lot of those things another thing that I loved about my wife was she has a heart for like homeless, like people who can't do anything for her in return. Mm-hmm. Great. Trait. Like she, she loves helping the homeless. She loves helping like baby. She hates seeing baby starving and stuff like that. So when I seen those traits, people, Oh, well, how did you get married in six months after meeting somebody on Instagram? Well, seeing these traits and having this constant conversation like i was like i knew what i wanted and i went after it you know yeah so i i totally agree with you uh about especially like the, the work ethic and the love for god there are some questions that i want to ask this is our bonus round because i want to be respect i want to respect your time i ain't got nothing to do i ain't going nowhere but <laughs> keep going because I, I, I have a bunch of questions but i guess we're gonna have to do a part two to this Part two is fine. <laughs> okay, that's what's up. I just wanted to confirm that. So Bravehearts community, you heard it. So Sabrina says she's gonna come back. So make sure that she come back and make sure you hit her up and be like, hey, you said anyway. <laughs> what and there's no right or wrong answer to this. What is the biggest mistake you see women make in relationships? Ooh. Comparison. Comparison. Ooh. Let's talk about that. Ooh. And it's hard because we, it's so unconscious for most of us. It's so unconscious for most of us. <clears throat> but I, and, and I don't even think we always realize that we're doing it because right now the world is telling us that we deserve the world and we do. Okay. <laughs> and we do. Mm-hmm. But but then it's not challenging us to realize that we don't need the world. And so here we are looking at this girl get her version of the world and that girl get her version of the world and that girl get her version of the world. And we're looking for all of that. I want it all. I want all of that. I want the man to give me the money. I want the man. And that's why we be having, you know, especially out here in the streets. You got a man for this, you got a man for that, you got a man for that, you got a man for that. Because in our work, in our mind, our framework, that's how we get the world. Until one man can come give us all of that. Um, so one man can take us on the trips. Until one man can, you know, can can give us our weekly stipend or whatever it is. Until one man can make us laugh until we cry. Until one man can can work out with us. and you know, Until one man can do all those different things. And so one man can lay it down how we want it to be laid down. Mm. Uh huh. Can do all of those things, then we won't settle. We have compared ourselves to all the different versions, even you know the women before us, 
our mothers and our grandmothers and our aunties and our, you know, all these women before us. We compared ourselves to all these different people and what they had. My our our grandma had a my grandma had a man who brought home that check every week and he did it. Da, 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 and I ain't gonna settle for nothing less than that. And my daddy did this for my mama, and I'm not gonna, and I get it. Especially if you've seen it up close. And your daddy is, you know, your daddy is a, that's wonderful, right? But you still have to realize that you are an individual woman. You ain't your mama. You ain't your mama. And the father you met might not have been the father or the man that she met. And so who he became in front of you was a result of the two becoming one. You're going to have to become one with a completely different man, baby girl. So you're going to have to actually realize, find out who you are so you can know what you need. So you can know what you need, you can know what you don't need, what you do, what you can't tolerate, and what you will tolerate. Because somebody going to have to tolerate something with you, sis. Baby girl, you know you can't cook. You know you can't. And it's a man out there who with his whole heart want a woman who's going to cook for him every single night. And y'all might see each other and be deathly attracted to one another and have all these other, but if he's not budging on that, then you ain't for him. And if he's willing to deal with that, then you have to be humble enough to recognize that that's where you fall short for him. So you gotta be ex willing to accept whatever it is that he's falling short for you in your book, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, comparison, you know, say it, all, they say it all the time, comparison is the thief of joy. And I really think that uh, uh, comparison is one of those things where um, it just it steals so much. Mm -hmm. It steals so much. I don't. I don't. While I don't think, while I don't think that I compared myself, I know. I know for a fact that I didn't compare myself consciously in my marriage to other women or anything like that, or compare my relationship to other relationships, uh, because I, I, for what. Right. I do think that if I like really dig down deep, even comparing my actual relationship to the relationship I made up in my mind that I think I need. How is that helping anybody? How is that helping anybody mm -hmm. versus comparing my relationship as it is to what God wants it to be? That's the only comparison that should really exist. Who am I? Who do God want me to be? What does my relationship with my partner look like? And what does God want it to look like? That's the only comparison. Everything else is stupid. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. You don't need what sister girl over there got. You don't need it. You don't need it. Baby girl, you don't even like PDA. So you don't need a man who's just all up under you all the time. You don't like it. Do you realize that? You don't even like that. Sit down. Stop being jealous. Yeah. Well, and especially even with social media. Right. I mean, I think it makes it even that much harder for people to to not compare because every because time we're inundated. Yep. We're inundated with this is what your expectation should be. I even have to be careful with that. I've, I've started being more intentional about some of the messaging that I'm putting out, especially in my captions. I just posted, you know, a video or uh, not a, yeah, a video or whatever. And, and my caption, my you know more, most recent caption was talking about how a man should plan things. There are some girls who are just okay with chill time. So my I, my message is for the girls who are not okay with chill time. <laughs> my my message is for the girls who don't want to just let things flow and happen as they may. My message is for the girls who want a certain type of intentionality, a certain type of even thinking back to my ex who is an attorney. His he is very much regimented very much a man of routine. If he asked me to come chill today, I know he wouldn't just mean chill. He would already have an idea, a plan in his head of what we're going to do that evening. And there will be, you know, a, a flow to it all. But it, I'm not, we, we, I ain't never, in the whole time I ever been with him, we ain't never just Netflix and chill. So let me ask you this real quick before we go any further, because you, you, you done started something. So when a lot of men say, you know, because I seen your video and you talked about that, and I thought it was so good. You was like, I don't have time to waste. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> but but why why is it that a lot of women and I'm throwing American quotes kind of like fall for for the trap? Because at the end of the day, it's really not Netflix and chill. 
But it's like because we want attention. Because we want because we want attention. We want attention. Mm-hmm. I'm I've been there. I'm guilty of it. I've showed up to chill before. Mm-hmm. I showed up to chill for dudes that I admired in one way or another, and got there. And we talked for a few minutes, and he tried to Disney Channel his way into my ocean. Like I said, <laughs> like like. I've been there. I've done that, right? We want we want to be seen. We want to be known. We want we want that good conversation. We want that person to look at us and to think we're beautiful and to laugh with us to to you know whatever it is, right? And cognitively, we know that chill even if the even if it's not expressed, even if it's not like come over and X, Y, and Z. It's always on the table. Always. It's always. I don't care what he says, sis. I don't care what he say. It's on the table. I think we need to make this segment into a reel. This needs to be like an Instagram reel because this, if you could just say that again for the people in the back, because I think sometimes, you know. (laughs) I said what I said. I don't care what that man said you was coming over to do. If he asked you to come over to chill, sex is always on the table. It's always. Now you have the right to say no. And how we, he responds to that lets you know what type of man he is. Okay. So we got to be careful. Got to be careful. But if you give him the inkling that it's possible, he's going to go for it. He's going to go for it. It's on the table. It's up for discussion. It's available. He wants it. And if you do too, be honest about that. Don't play no games with the man. Like, But if you don't, if you don't, your best bet is to not, go not chill. Do not go chill. Do not pass go. Do not pay, Do not collect $200. Stay at home. But if you are open to that, then, you know, go about your business, okay? I ain't going to judge you. I ain't going to judge you at all. That's your business, girl. But if, you ain't told, if you're not doing that, you gonna have to text back like I'm sorry. I don't. I don't chill. I'm, I don't chill. I, if you would like to meet at a coffee shop and talk, great. If you would like to take a walk outside, wonderful. I'm not. I'm not chilling with you. Yeah. I'm not chilling with you. And, and and that's okay. That's like that's and you can find out what kind of man he is, like you said, just by you setting boundaries. Because I do believe people who break boundaries, like it's not going to leave. That's who they He's are. Not safe. They respect their boundaries. Yeah, you're not safe, right? And then you get into this relationship. Because I'm going to bring someone on a show who's going to talk about entertaining red flags. Ooh. Like, how long are you going to just entertain it? And then when you find out it's not what you thought it was, then you get on social media and you blast him or her or you blast men or women in general. But I'm going to tell you what they're not going to say. The entertaining red flags is a red flag because maybe, girl, you knew better. Mm. You knew better. You chose to hurt yourself in that way because you knew you you seen this over and over again. He keep playing in your face and you keep letting him. For what? For what? Unless you want to be played with. If you want, if you, if you hear the play, then baby, let's play. Let's play all the games. I can I can guarantee you. I can get I can guarantee you if he playing games, you play, you could go ahead and play games right back. Go ahead and entertain them red flags, entertain them over here, over there, and it on the float on the chair. Because ain't can't be no honesty and trust and building in a space like that. It can't happen. And you are not helping yourself by doing that. You literally looking at this situation and you're a talent, you're you're lying to yourself. That's not healthy. That's not good. You're either lying to yourself or you lying to everybody else trying to make it seem like something is happening that ain't happening. But you really on BS undercover. Like if you on BS back, baby, I don't blame you. Go ahead and play the game. Have it fun. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you ooh, ooh, yeah. oof, entertain the red flags. That's gonna be a good show. Oh you yeah. Have to watch that sure. one. Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. And like you said, to be honest about your intentions, if you're okay with that, be okay with it. You know, don't don't play with it. 
I wanted to ask you about, oh, there's so many questions. From seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? Oh, child. First of all, my parents wasn't married. Um, but I wasn't mom, either, but you know. But anyway. My mom and dad uh, grew up together around the corner from each other. Um, let me let me first say that my mother is, uh, my mother got hit by a car when she was two years old. And so she is both physically and menti- mentally handicapped. And so that comes with its own set of uh, um, um, emotional traumas and damages that uh, contributed into me being here. And me understanding that and knowing that from a very young age, um, as a result of parentification and so many other you know, things that I wouldn't want for my children uh, means that I have approached looking at my mom's relationships, all of her relationships through a different lens. So with that said, her being with my dad, it was more of a, you know, childhood friends, fake dating, faking a relationship, whatever, whatever, getting down. My mama just really, really want a baby really bad because she want to feel love. She want to feel you know, affirmed. She want to feel like she like she has somebody to call her own. That's I'm a product of that. I am her fifth pregnancy, the first one that actually made it. Mm-hmm. So I am a miracle in that sense. But I'm also there was I came here with a mission and a responsibility placed on me that, in all fairness, should not be placed on children. Mm-hmm. Um. So then after that, after immediately after my mom is pregnant, my dad is gone. I have a little brother who's like maybe a year younger than me he goes and marries his mother um and they live their life and my dad is you know my dad is in the house with my uh half brother on his side being a family and i'm at home with my little brother from my mother's second relationship which she did get legally married and this is the one that i learned from probably more Mm -hmm. because um he met my mom and my stepfather got married um when I was two, maybe three. No, I was two. I was two because I didn't turn three until after my brother was born. And he they met because me and my stepdad shared the same birthday. So when I came to the hospital, he looked at my birthday, he realized we had the same birthday. They started talking. They did what pe- grown folks do. My little brother, you know, whatever, they get married. Mm-hmm. Immediately after they get married. My stepdad, who is an army man and very much like me, a natural loner, uh, prioritizes freedom and autonomy. Both he and I have that very much in common. Um, He is gone in the wind. He out of there. Um, And they still remain married to this day. And I don't remember him living with us for longer than six or eight months at any time and never like. That's probably collectively over the span of my life. He's lived with us two years um, when you add all the time together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a period in my life, like the first half of my life. After my mama got saved for real, because at first she was in the streets when I was a little, 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 little girl. She was in them street streets. OK. <laughs> Uh, even being married, shoot, I remember being six and I got in trouble for some stuff I had seen. But after that, after she had got saved for real, uh, she was really like trying to be faithful to this man. She was in married couples ministry all by herself at church. Wasn't no man to be found. You wouldn't even know she was married because you ain't never seen this man. She keeps saying she married too. But she was like really trying to be a faithful wife up until I probably got to high school. And then she realized, I guess, like, that's never going to be that. And God is going to send me a husband and um, or another husband. Mm -hmm. But I think they came to the agreement that until they find somebody else worth marrying, there's no point in getting a divorce, which in my mind makes sense because divorces cost money. Mm -hmm. And this woman got my kid. And not only does she have my kid, but she has another kid that I care about. So at least if I die, she gets my VA benefits or whatever. Like, and my kids are taken care of and I don't have to worry about that. Right. So, so cognitively, I get why they stayed together. Sure. Um, and like I said, they're still together this, to this day. My stepdad was just here a few weeks ago, spent a couple weeks here visiting my kids and, you know, visiting us. And we had a great time. It was wonderful. But now he's back in California living his best single life and doing what he want to do. And they do weird stuff like kiss and say how and like say how much they love each other. And it's just like. 
what is this a what is are y'all married are y'all not married like what's going on here yeah. i'm so i'm so confused and yeah. because like i said me and my stepdad share a very similar temperament mm -hmm. um i understand what it feels like to be feel like you're caged in especially by people's expectations and needs and to want to fly away from that, which he's able to do. I, I cognitively couldn't do it if I tried. Yeah. But um, the number one thing that that relationship taught me that I had to unlearn and that I'm still unlearning is you can be in a relationship and you can, you know, it, don't, it doesn't require love. You can tough it out for the kids. You can make it work, right? Honestly, I, if if that wasn't such a part of the fabric of my understanding of how I can move in the world, I probably wouldn't have got married when I did, if at all, to my ex to my ex husband. Because as much as I loved him, and I did, I I was afraid that the only reason we were getting married was because we had a kid, and I was willing to do that because in my mind, you add my upbringing of them staying married. For the sake of the children. Plus the Christian ethic. Why wouldn't I marry this man? Mm -hmm. And then to stay through. Everything that we went through. As long as I did. Up until the point where I ended up in a mental institution. I should have lived long before the mental institution. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I had to unlearn. Staying for the kid. I also had to unlearn. The idea that my partner doesn't have to care about me for real, doesn't have to love me for real. Um, it's, it's so much I had to unlearn. But the, the double, I, I, I learned so many damaging things that I could survive a marriage that was a sham, that I could um, maintain a devotion to the idea of marriage, but not actually do the work to to practice it. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's it was, it's a lot, and I'm still trying to untie, mm -hmm. unweave that web mm -hmm. in my heart and mind. For sure, no, I appreciate the the transparency because there's going to be somebody who's listening or watching who can fully identify, and through your testimony you'll be able to help somebody else because you just never know. Yeah. So I appreciate the transparency. I have one last question because we're kicking it now. Okay. There's no right or wrong answer. Is it easier to love yourself or someone else? That's a hard question. <laughs> and, and there's hard... no wrong answer. They, you, you'll be surprised and listen to some of the other shows where people say, but for me personally, it's easier to love myself. I'm not going to lie. Okay. I'm not going to lie. Okay. I don't think I've ever struggled with self-esteem issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't. Like, I've, I've definitely had um, not a high enough view of self, but I've never had a low view of self. <laughs> like, uh, um, I, I, might not, I, I, I might be honest enough to admit I'm not the most beautiful person in the room. But baby, I know I ain't ugly. I know I ain't stupid. Like, I actually think I'm really, really freaking dope. <laughs> I think I'm amazing. As you should. And I'm, I'm in love with myself. I love spending time with myself. Me and me have a good time, right? Um, As to because of my personality and just how I'm just how I'm set up, it is it is very hard work for me to even socialize. It takes a lot to people I love, my own kids. It takes a lot for me to connect with people, to practice that that empathy that I actually naturally have. Like I really deeply, I I, I can see you crying and I'm just going to start crying just because that's just how my brain just be set up. I just be like, why am I crying? You don't even know what's going on. It doesn't matter, right? I very much feel a lot and... um. And I am very charismatic, so it makes it easy for me to connect with people in practice. Mm -hmm. But like 
I, I need five to seven business days between hanging out with my best friends because as much as I love the laughter and love the the all the kicking and the, having a good time, I really like me uh, and my thoughts a lot better. <laughs> like I like being alone with myself so much better than being with other people. I enjoy my own self more than I enjoy anybody else. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, like I truly mean that with my real, then that's, that's why I'd be like, I don't want to get married again. I don't really want to be in a relationship. Like I got, I got, the, I did that already. I checked. I did that. I did the relationship. I got the kids. We bought the house. We did all the things that the people we want to do. I want to spend time with me. I want to do what I want to do on my time. I don't want to do it on nobody else's time. I want to do it like when I want to do it. Yeah. Me and me, we good. Mm. The caveat though is how do I treat myself? I'm far better at serving other people than I am at serving myself. I am far better at being loyal to other people and practicing self betrayal. I will, for all this stuff I could preach about, don't go over there if you don't want to. I will put myself in that very position knowing that I don't want it. Knowing that I don't want it with somebody who is objectively unsafe and find myself in a situation that I don't want to be in and, and be hurt because I shouldn't have put myself in that position in the first place. Not to excuse what they do, but at this big grown age, I have a choice. And if I can tell that that person is unsafe, I shouldn't put myself in that situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the practice of loving myself is hard, but the thought and the emotion of loving myself is very much easier. Mm. Okay. I know I said I had one last question. I know I-, I you, can, you can ask 10 more last questions. <laughs> I, I, I'm loving it here. We're having a great time. I know, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad we made this this happen because, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you seem very in tune with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Because I, I think that's something that might be missing from a lot of uh, people today that they they aren't in tune with themselves. So where, where does that come from for Sabrina? And when did that switch turn on for you? Um, I do think it's a, I do I do think it's a uh, partially a, a gift from God because I've always been like this ever since I was a little girl. Okay. And I think the number one thing that has um aided in that, especially when I was younger, is the practice of journaling. I have journaled since I knew how to write, and I have written down every feeling, every emotion, all of it, all of it. <laughs> everything in journals since, like I said, since I was a little girl. And I will go back and read those things, uh, especially years and years later, to remember, right? As a, as a victim of childhood sexual trauma, my brain can sometimes erase memories or give me memories that aren't memories at all. They're imaginations. Mm -hmm. And so journaling was a very important uh, tool for me to remember how I feel about certain situations, remember the experiences themselves. Um, and in that quiet time that I fight so hard for, I sit with my thoughts, even the ugliest, scariest thoughts. I sit with them and I battle with them and I ask myself hard questions and I answer myself. I, me and me be having real, real, real talks, like for real, for real. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily fight. I used to fight, fight certain thoughts when I was like younger in the Christian tradition, you shouldn't think like that. And it's like, I don't want to think like this. And these intrusive thoughts keep coming. Let's figure out where they coming from. Why are they here? What are they trying to get me to believe or do? Are they true? Um, a lot of prayer, a lot of meditation, uh, and, and really, uh, but I said, I, I do say it's a gift from God because my natural temperament is such that I like to be alone. I like quiet. <laughs> I like, I like my bubble and I just like to be off in that world. I could be there for hours and hours and hours. And so I do. And, and everybody isn't like that, right? Some people are legitimately extrovert. I have a son who is legitimately extroverted. And it is very hard 
for me to teach him how to practice that self-awareness um, because his understanding of the world, his energy, all of it comes from other people, connection. Uh, and for me, it's, it's not that that's never, it's, that's never been the case for me. I only know that I need relationship because that's what I was created for. Mm -hmm. And I do authentically enjoy relationship, mm -hmm. but my energy comes from on the inside. That's just how I was made. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really don't have no real key, but you know, journaling is great. It helps. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I, I totally agree because I'm able to get back into journaling myself and, and it helps. Um, and especially when you go back and you look at some of the things that you talked about, you know, and then just being in tune with your feelings uh -huh. um, and, and not evading your feelings, like being able to mm -hmm. sit there. So I'm glad that you said that because the time, a lot of times people like to get away from what they truly feel because they, they feel convicted or I shouldn't feel like this or I shouldn't feel like that. But like God made your feelings, right? Like we feel. Um, so I think it's important to, especially when it comes to decision making, I will tell people though, it's important to, to be regulated before you make decisions, you know, emotional okay. decisions, because <laughs> there are some things you like, yeah, I wasn't thinking when, when I, when I made that decision, you know, so it is okay. important to be emotionally regulated. So I will say that, uh, okay. I'm gonna stop saying last question. Cause I'm gonna keep asking you questions. That's good. <laughs> I love it. You want radical honesty? <laughs> I know, right? I know. Let, let's talk about it. So, the Instagram following. Okay. It, now that I get a chance to actually speak with you, because I see what you post on Threads, I see what you post on Twitter um, and Instagram. Now that I get to kind of see behind a curtain, how did you grow your audience? Because talking to you. I wouldn't see that you would have a hundred thousand followers considering your content and how honest and upfront you are. Like you are the total antithesis of having a, a hundred thousand followers and subscribers with your content. So what's the secret sauce? Um, honestly, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be as honest as I can. But this will be it's because I have uh, a, a nice shape. It is It is 97% of my followers are men. 97. Okay. And most of them come, have come during, uh, as, a, as a product of content that I have created mm -hmm. where my shape was somehow ev like super evident, right? So like there's a video that I made two years ago about being a teacher in grades or something like that. Please don't talk to me or something like that. And there's a side profile. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have this body my whole life. I've never, ever, I don't even think about it when I'm creating content. I don't, I really don't consider it. I don't, I, and I never have, right? Mm -hmm. I, my followers went from like 700 to like 8,000 in a month. <laughs> then, then, <laughs> then there was the video where uh, this was just last November, I think <laughs> where I'm in the classroom and I'm picking up papers and then I sit down and I'm like, you know, I want to go on vacation, but I don't have time. Something like that went from 8,000 to like 20,000 in three days. Cause my, cause there's a shot of my behind. That's the first thing you see in the video. Mm -hmm. Now, again, when I filmed this, I don't see behind. I see me picking up papers in my classroom. For sure. But when everybody else see it, <laughs> they see it behind. Yeah. Right? And then that continues to grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. And then even with this, I was sitting at 80,000 for a little for a couple for a couple weeks. And then this most recent reel where I'm wearing the brown and I'm standing in the Nike factory mm -hmm. brought me from 80,000 to 107,000. That specific reel. Yeah. And like I said, 97,000 uh, 97, men. 97,000. Yeah. Right? So even if I'm, and, 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 and my subscribers, which are different than my followers, because I do have like Instagram subscriptions, they pay $4.99 a month, they get exclusive content, we have exclusive lives where I talk specifically to them, I allow them to jump in the lives, we have conversations, it gets really, really real. I'll talk to the men about 
getting massages and the value of touch in men's lives because most men, especially black men, do not get touched positively often from the time that they're born. And I think that that is so, it, it, it contributes to just so much of the terrible things that they experience in their lives and that we experience in turn as women, both sexually and non-sexually when it comes to touch, emotion, how we operate, all that. And so like we have all these types of conversations and we are honest and we are real. And one of them was real enough to admit like, yeah, no, nah, I followed you because you got a big booty. I did. And, and it's not like you out here twerking or shaking it or doing anything like that, which is a whole different like, ooh, for a certain type of man. Yep. Um, Like, dang, she not out here. She not out here intentionally. There are some weirdos who think I am intentionally putting it on the internet. And then there are other weirdos who say it just because they want me to respond, which I would never do because I don't respond to negativity, not in my home, not in my classroom. And I for darn sure won't do it on the internet for free. Uh (laughs) So. Not for free. um, But but all of them, Mm. all of them click because of the booty. That's what they click for. What they stay for in many cases is another chance to see it. They don't want to miss it when it come back around. Because it's not like it's just all you see when you scroll down the page. Right? Which is a part of the allure. Like, she got a booty. Mm-hmm. She'll be different. Right? Which is what I who I am. Right. I am thick and I don't talk about it. And I don't care about it. Mm-hmm. And so what? So what? So what? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's who I am in real life. Yeah. But also, when I'm out with my, with my girls, I am going to twerk. And I'm going to, you know what I'm saying? We all have a good time. I'm going to dance. Right. That's and right. whatever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> mm-hmm. Church boy, you see what you see. Don't act like you don't see it. You see, you see it. So, okay? so what you're saying is I don't have a chance to get 100,000 subscribers. That's what you're telling me. I'm not <laughs> saying I'm that. I'm messing I'm messing but no, it is important. It is it's, it's 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 interesting because right, I, my 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 core audience that I've always wanted to engage with was women. I didn't want these men following me. I still, I'm not gonna say I, I appreciate them. I appreciate them. I appreciate the numbers and what that allows me to do and how that allows me to move in the world. But I always wanted to connect with women more than anything. Like, I love women. I am a woman. I, w- I want women. <laughs> I want women. Um, and I've tried to, I'm trying to, in this season, be more intentional about specifically what I post. I can't control the booty part. Of course. Yeah, I can't control that. Women like looking at booty too. (laughs) And I'm women. I like seeing pretty girls with nice bodies. Okay. I do too. But what are, what, what are women, what do women stay for? As a woman, I'm trying to be more intentional about that. And so I think consistent, growing in consistency, yes, using what you have, using what you have for sure, Mm -hmm. Uh, but paying attention to the market. I think you offer here, especially at, especially with something like Scary to Remarry, or that's what it's called, right? Yes. Scary. Yeah, right. So give me some marketing tips because I'm I'm going to be selfish. This this is my segment. So so how can I, what can I do since, you know? Help me. Yeah, out. I, I'm being I think you're already doing some really, really, really dope and amazing things. I don't know how often you go live or anything like that, but um, even having conversations like this live, right? Um, my lives are very, very uh popular and uh amongst men, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> they they give me a lot of interaction. A lot of men subscribe from the live. Um. Which is, you know, no no small thing to get somebody to spend phone and that on you. Like it ain't only fans, yeah. but whatever. Like and they keep subscribing to me because they want to keep going live with me personally. Um, I think that you offer something that I don't see on it. I ain't never seen nothing like this on the internet before, especially understanding that uh second and third marriages have higher divorce rates than first marriages. Yes. Um 57% second time. Okay, it'd be like, okay, people be out of there that second time. <laughs> I don't even see how they do it a third time. But more than that, more than that was such a high number of, of divorces. A lot of us are scarred. I, 
baby, when I was fresh about that thing, I was cussing everybody out who told me God got another marriage. I would say, you are, don't you lie on my Lord. I might denounce Jesus if he tried to get me married again. Like that was my mindset because I was terrified at the idea of going back into what I had just come from. Mm. If that's what marriage is, God, you might, you, you, you might, you should kill me before you put me in that. Cause I don't want that. That was terrible. That almost killed me. Like I don't want it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so the men, this is real ministry work. This is real. And especially if you're a believer, so much shame. So much. There's so much shame. There's so much guilt and, a, and, even, and even more fear, right? Don't add kids to the mix, right? Because now it's like, I'm not looking for my kids to step dead. I don't want to be, I don't want to be in a relationship at all. But if I was, I'm looking for a partner. My kids got a daddy. However, because of the type of daddy they got and the type of life that he and I built for them, I'm not taking anything less than what I could like build with the next person. It's the, forget me downgrading. My kids not finna downgrading the stepdaddy. Maybe you got me a Yeah. And I'm not even talking about like a financial provision because there are things that another person might be able to do in the physical that my uh that their father may not be able to provide. I have brothers that fish and teach my children how to fish. Mm-hmm. I have brothers who own 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 businesses and allow my children to partner with them and watch them and work with them in their businesses and teach my children entrepreneurship, right? So they get to show up for my sons and my daughters in ways that their father, not that I won't say can't, yeah. but he don't know how yet, or he don't have a capacity or whatever. Like, and that's not to down him or put any shade towards him. My they daddy do for them. They daddy do they with they daddy right now. Yeah. Like they daddy got them. Hmm. But that the community of men that I have in my life really give them. And so in a partner, you think I'm yeah. No, I'm not finna be with the drug dealer. I'm just not. Yeah. I'm just not. Sure. It's not. I don't care if you have a legal dispensary. That's cool. That's just not the culture of the family that I built yes. with with my baby daddy and my kids. Yes. That's not a, a part of the culture that I want in my, in my home and in my family. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. I support you as a friend. Mm-hmm. That's not what I want for my kids. Yeah. Legal or not. It's not and what I, I want. And I respect that. that. That's a beautiful thing because what you're saying with having that community a lot of women don't have that, you know, so that's the unfortunate part. Yeah. And that's the unfortunate unfortunate part. And because, and I always tell people, and especially like if I'm posting something on Twitter about my wife, I'm like, I'm recovering, right? Like every woman should have that, whether if that's a father or uncle or brother, somebody community, community, you know, I got that big time. That's beautiful. So that's something that, again needs to be addressed and maybe that's a that's another topic within itself like how do you get that community because even going through a divorce i know for because i have a 20 year old daughter okay from that marriage and she's in another state she came to stay with us for for a couple of years before she graduated high school but she got a chance to see daddy do it all over again um and the whole thing behind scared to remarry is the brave arts community know but me going through a divorce i got a chance to look at myself and was like do i even really want to do this again you know i remember just being in a shower like crying like god what world is going on because i was married for 15 years and i'm going through this process and separation and divorce and i was like i don't know if i even really want to get out here again (laughs) Yeah, right. I'm just thinking I'm just going to do my podcast and my YouTube videos and I'm going to raise my daughter and I'm going to do this entrepreneurship thing. And then I see my wife on Instagram. Ain't that good. <laughs> Look at her. just do that like that. Hey. I slid, hey, hey Sabrina, I slid in the DM and, and she just, and I'm 12 years older than her, right? Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm just that much older, but just to see our dynamic and the way we connect, and I'm just like, she's too great of a woman. I don't want to I don't want to lose her. 
let me get mm. to know her in a deeper way because when you find a good person just when you find somebody good like especially in today's culture mm. um but anyway i'm rambling i'm glad she thought she was good too that's wonderful that yeah is wonderful yeah she she uh called me a pawpaw when we first got together because she was like you dress like an old man we gotta we love that though <laughs> we love that a little banter she's a baby you're an old man it's okay god worked it worked it he worked I had, it. I had to accept that i was like oh i guess i'm getting old but anyway and i'm sorry uh these 34 35 year olds out here mm-hmm. they're stupid so they're <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, they're not that they're not that bright. Oh my <laughs> so God. It, it almost feels like at this age we gotta be up in the 40s with y'all. Like mm-hmm. why y'all don't think we ooh, <laughs> why y'all have no hobbies, no interests, no values, no we too old for this. Yeah. Oh my god. I have to bring you back on because there's a part two. I'm I'm feeling this brewing in my spirit. Look. Um, yeah, we're gonna have to do <laughs> because I, I want to talk about because with the marriage, and again, this is scary to remarry. I I would love to talk to you again about just more of whatever you're willing to discuss. Again, it's all about ministry and helping other people. Um, and not to put the X out there or anything of that nature, but just like even your healing process, just going through those different things and be able to help people because I'm always an advocate for love. Um, and even if you had your heart broke that you can love again Um, and remarriage isn't for everybody but I would love to talk to you about that process so I'm going to hold you to that so okay Okay. I look forward to it (laughs) for sure Uh, I want to acknowledge you first of all for sharing uh, your story for sharing the things that you've been through even just on a smaller scale where you didn't talk about too much but I could just really see the passion and the honesty behind this. I want to acknowledge you for those things and like just pursuing your dreams and your poetry off the chain. Thank uh, you. Parenting mom of four and just being able to walk in your confidence and being secure in who you are, especially in the social media world. So I want to acknowledge you for those things. Uh, Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you, Sabrina. Well, you can find me at she dot unapologetic that's s-h-e period u-n-a p-o-l-o-g-e-t-i-c on instagram on tiktok i'm sabrina lachey on twitter because somebody stole she unapologetic and they've had that account and they've not done anything with it for like the this is now almost seven years that i've had this brand name and i don't know what to do about that i don't know how to get twitter to give it to me but whatever the case may be (laughs) sabrina lachey on twitter she unapologetic on Instagram and uh, TikTok. Um, and I do have a YouTube channel that she do everything, which is under the she unapologetic brand, because I really do do everything. I work with my hands. I do poems. I teach. I do nails. I do hair. Child, I do everything. I be building stuff like I really do everything. <laughs> um and then um, I also have a blog. Um, soon it will be again, sheunapologetic.com. Uh, but you can just go to Instagram, click the link in my bio. And uh, yeah, that's how you can find me. <laughs> for sure, for sure. I'm going to have all that information or at least with your Instagram linked up in the description. So Brave Arts community, make sure you connect with Sabrina because I only bring awesome people on the show, right? Just people that I really believe in. So make sure you <laughs> connect with Sabrina. Make sure you uh, subscribe as well on her Instagram. So make sure you do that. Well, Brave Arts community, you heard it here. Make sure if you are watching this via YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button, share this with someone. Again, the, the latest revelation that I've got is to get inside of the group chats. If you can share my content in your group chats, I would love it. That's how you get more views. I said, oh my God, the group chat is where it is. So I've been missing out on that. <laughs> and if you are listening via podcast, make sure if you are listening on Apple Podcasts to hit the subscribe button and also to leave a rating and review. Would love to hear from you. This is Sean Heineman with special guest. Sabrina, also known as Sheet Unapologetic. All right, Brave Forest community, take care.
Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of A Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarried, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here. But anyway, go watch another video. Thank you.